All right, guys, thanks for watching. I thought I'd go out and do one on the road just for a bit of an old change. I'm still on the track at the moment, not a real road, but this is where nature is. I love being on this track, actually. And I wanted to talk about astral projection today, uh, something that Mina brought up the other day. And I know it's quite important to a lot of us who follow uh, the spiritual path, uh, because as much as anything, it's a way of actually coming out of everyday uh, reality, the world that we're used to, and actually getting a taste of what else there is. And there's a lot else, believe me, if you've never kind of actually looked into it, there is a lot to be found out there. Um, and it varies for everyone who looks into it, I think, because we are all different and uh, any spiritual lesson we get is always tailored to ourselves personally and it comes in for that reason. But uh, my, my first experience of astral projection, I, I didn't go very far with it actually, uh, a friend of mine had a tape, a cassette tape, it was that long ago, in uh, oh, about early 1980s I suppose, and uh, it was just this man with a very calm, kind of gentle voice talking you down until he kind of was sleepy and not exactly hypnotised, but you went into that state where you were kind of between worlds. And uh, that was about as far as I could get with it. Um, it was, my friend had got this tape for a bit of a laugh, really. Uh, we were in the forces and his dad was a hippie and he kind of borrowed this tape because he thought it was a great laugh. So he didn't take it all that seriously. And I'm not surprised we didn't get very far as a result of that. But um, it was a really interesting experience and it was an experience that came back uh, into my life. Oh, probably about three or four years later, um, I was talking to a lady who was very interested in trying astral projection and asked me if I knew anything about it. So I'd started reading the tarot by that time and I was starting to get known as somebody sort of esoteric, someone who was interested in mystical things and might know a thing or two. Uh, I'm not sure how much I did know in those days, actually. But... Um, I told her, well, you know, I'm, I'm not qualified, I'm not an expert, I've never actually done this for anybody before, but I think I know what to say and I think I know what to do to get you there. And uh, she agreed, to know how wise that was, but it all worked out actually, it was no bad thing really. So I did it and uh, she reached the point, see at the end of this meditation the man would stop talking and that's what I did, I sort of said my piece and uh, there was no music on or anything like that but so I just kind of calmly said and now I'll leave you to follow your own path go out and explore and soon you'll wake up because you must always implant the suggestion in the person that they will wake up if there's any sound of alarm, any kind of emergency, anything like that and uh, that kind of is, is also part and parcel of just getting the person relaxed because um, to go into meditation we need to be able to leave our problems behind as much as possible and uh, if you're struggling to meditate because of that don't worry keep trying it, it takes time it really does but the bottom line is you know any problems that we have that we feel we've got to hang on to in this world and see them to their completion will still be there when we come back and we will be able to sort it out so we got all all those suggestions uh, implanted as much as I could and this lady kind of went off she had a lovely experience she said she came back and said it was amazing and this surprised me because I you know all I'd done was really repeat what I'd heard on this tape years ago I probably hadn't repeated it all properly but anyway she went off and she had this experience and I was quite jealous because I'd never been flying like that so now here we are at the road no one about today, I guess it's because it's Sunday. I sort of angled the camera a bit so you can see out the window a wee bit better, or at least I hope you can. <laughs> uh, so yeah, then came my, uh, my attempt at astral projection, my first really serious attempt at it, when I found out that it had worked for someone else because of what I'd said, I thought, well, I'll try it. So uh, try it, I did. And uh, it was wonderful. I couldn't actually let myself go all the way. Um, strangely, really, because I, I was very kind of open to it and very keen to try it. But I couldn't let myself go all the way. Uh, what did happen, though, was I started to hear some music out of nowhere. And it was music that I'd forgotten completely. Uh, music from years and years ago when I'd been in uh, a country called Belize in, in the Caribbean basins, like in Central America. Um, and they have a particular kind of 
Well, it's, you know, it's, it's not just Belizean, it's Caribbean music, Afro-Caribbean music kind of Calypso songs. And um, what I heard was da, 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 King Short Shirt. Um, and I think it's called Tourist Lego with two L, uh, two G's, Tourist Lego. And I could hear that starting up. And I, I, I knew that somehow I'd astrally travelled to Belize. And that scared the life out of me, so I came back quick. <laughs> And I guess the thing really was that uh, the silver cord wasn't very developed because the silver cord is what keeps us connected to this world, keeps us grounded and actually allows us to come back uh, when those suggestions are coming into play about we've got to wake up at any sound of alarm, we've got to wake up if there's something urgent to be sorted out. All those things come into play in that way. Um, and so I, I brought myself back and when I think about it I think I would have stretched the silver cord much too far if I'd continued trying to do that and then nothing happened for quite a long time no one asked me to do it no one kind of suggested it and I didn't feel like doing it again it was fascinated me but I don't know life moved on somehow and I guess I didn't believe in it as much as a lot of people do so uh, as life moved on I kept on reading the tarot and it was probably about two years after that, I think this would have been about 1987 by now. Um, and uh, there, there was a friend of mine lived in a house which was number 123. And it always seemed like a kind of a magical place. And I think perhaps it had that rather special number for a reason, I don't know. I wouldn't like to say it was haunted, it was quite kind of spooky. I didn't enjoy being in there by myself, but never had any bad experiences or anything. And then one night there was a party going on and uh, so I was there. I think we'd all had a little bit too much to drink, quite honestly. And uh, quite suddenly, quite suddenly I was up above looking down on the people in the room and I could see everything they were thinking. I could see their thoughts. I could see who fancied each other and that kind of thing, you know. And uh, then I did something that I've learned never to do again. I told the people what they were thinking thinking that they'd be impressed and you know and well they were very impressed actually because that was what they were thinking but people don't want their thoughts dragged out and exposed like that that's what I learned um, and I had a terrible headache after that and someone who mm, stuck in gear here, someone who knows about these things then told me that um, she felt that actually I had uh, gone as far as the silver cord would allow me to without stretching it or anything like that And that's why I'd had that experience when I got there. So it's so important not to rush this in any way um, It's possible to force the third eye open um, But if I tell you that most people who force the third eye open do it because of, you know They've taken drugs like LSD, magic mushrooms, psilocybin, something like that and it forces the third eye open now I know in shamanic rituals and, and all kinds of levels of magic uh, drugs are used but they're used under some kind of supervision and um, me I'm, I'm an empty-headed Westerner you know maybe I shouldn't say that maybe my head's not that empty but we don't really understand the value of using things like that in our culture uh, I feel really quite strongly about that and so people can force the third eye open it's the last thing anyone should ever really do uh, and it can take years and years for it to calm down and settle down and I'd sort of forced my third eye open when I'd attempted to go as far as I could and I'd heard the music and realised I'd reached uh, Belize which is like right on the other side of the world from Cardiff in UK where I was at the time um, absolutely astonishing experience but as long as it's done carefully, I continue to think it's a really good thing. It's a really powerful way of someone coming to understand that there's more to heaven and earth than anything we ever see, for sure and for real, in our waking moments, in our normal waking life, in, in this life, in this world. But a very real thing, and a thing seriously worth taking seriously. So if you want to look into astral projection, friends, look into it very carefully, that's all I can say. But when I say be very careful, don't be put off doing it, don't give up on it, just take it easy, be careful, and be relaxed and calm when you do it. Um, the only bad thing that happened to me really was just a terrible headache, and I it could really feel as if there was a cord coming from the back of my head that I'd stretched too much. That's really all it was, um, it's 
also very important to hold the intention that you will come back if there's any sound of alarm, if there's any kind of emergency, if you smell burning or something. Um, because no matter how far you actually then go into that hypnotic state that, that goes with astral projection, you will actually have the safety and the ability to come back. If in doubt, I would do it in a group. I wouldn't just do it on your own. I would, you know, have someone there. Um, it doesn't actually have to be an expert. It just has to be someone who will understand that you mustn't go too far and will kind of very gently talk to you to bring you back after a certain time that uh, you've agreed together or whatever you feel is right, really. But feelings are a lot in this. That feelings make a huge difference uh, to how it goes, more so than just about any other spiritual work, really. But there is that space, you know, that, that amazing cosmic space just to one side of this life, this worldly incarnation. And uh, that is where people seem to step out. That's where I feel I stepped out to uh, when I went astrally projecting. And uh, that space also is, uh, I saw it very clearly when I was involved in uh, doing past life regression as a spiritualist thing. And I did that under supervision. I don't really understand it. But I do understand that essentially, you know, the thing to do is to talk the person into a, a situation where they felt able and safe and relaxed and willing to uh, step out into this, and it's like a corridor or a lift shaft or something. Probably looks different to everyone, now, I'm always saying that, but spirituality is very much tailored to who we are and where we're at at any given time. Oh, here we go. I'm not liking this, my car is like stuck in second gear, this is not good. It's kind of not too bad because it's a 20 mile an hour speed limit here, but uh, yeah. It's not going to be great for travelling around next week. Well, aren't things just busy here? Okay. Here we go, see, real world. I live in my ivory tower, real. It's not that much of an ivory tower. Other people are most definitely allowed into it. <laughs> but I live there in my spiritual place in the middle of nowhere in the trees. And reality is a thing we all have to deal with. I've got to come to the shops today, which is what I'm doing. Get a bit of food in. Because, you know, that's what keeps body and soul together, isn't it? So, let's park up and get something to munch. So, once you actually get away, get started, embark on that astral projection journey. Um, it is actually remarkable how far and how fast we can travel. Um, in fact, I've never really been aware that I was really um, actually physically going anywhere. But then, of course, I wasn't physically going anywhere. But it feels remarkably like physically going somewhere. So, to illustrate this point, let us physically go somewhere, friends. Now then. So we're back at my sort of favourite supermarket. It's not really favourite, but it's the nearest one. It's only a few miles from my house. <laughs> All the other ones are like kind of 20, 30 miles. So this is the one that does it. Better turn off though, because I'm going to get loads of number plates that I'm going to have to blur out. Might just get away with this one because it's a one-way street. But it's really important, folks, to remember that uh, whatever spiritual practice you're into, whatever you're doing, it's never a one-way street. Many people who teach us will try and instill fear. Um, I've no idea why it would be good to be afraid of something. But I guess, you know, that they, they want to be responsible and make sure they haven't kind of led us astray or led us into something that might cause a problem. They never have, though, you know, because... Uh, this is a spiritual thing, not a physical thing. That's the bottom line. So no matter how far we go, it's always going to be possible to come back. That's what really matters. That's what to really hang on to, because that's what really makes it safe, you know? The grounding exercises I'm always talking about, protecting yourself, all that matters. And that, in fact, might be a good subject for another video. Except to say that I know that a great many of my viewers, and, you know, thanks everyone for watching, uh, a great many of my viewers already know a lot of things about the spiritual life and the way to, to do things like grounding and protection. It's super important, though, and this is it again. We've all got our own way, we've all got our own possibilities. So here we go, and this is what I always kind of hope it's going to be like when I go into projection. 
Look, no houses. We're out in the countryside. Nothing there but green energy. Put a bit of a spurt on. We just fly up the hill into the clear blue skies. Look at all the daffodils out as well. Nature coming back to life. And a magpie. I don't know if you saw the magpie, but I did. It's almost like astral projection living here because it's so different to uh, town life and so much of what else is going on. Um, and it, one of the great things about astral projection actually is uh, the ability to escape or to feel that you can escape from the here and now, from the everyday kind of unpleasantnesses of life. And actually, it does not just unpleasantness, just the nuts and bolts of life. They become almost an enslavement. And this is a lot like the journey back, you know. Turned into this very quiet little road here. One of the very few roads in the UK where you don't have to drive on the wrong side of the road. Or the right side of the road, depending on which way you look at it. Because there isn't really a side of the road, you know. It's kind of both the same. And the journey back from astral projection, very much like the journey back from anything really special. It can feel a bit like an anticlimax, you know. It's a, a lot like this now. I'm back on the narrow roads. I'm going back to the place where I'm nearly always at. Um, but that's a very great comforting place to me, actually. And um, if we feel stuck, really, in the place where we live, astral projection is a great way to move beyond that and just to know that those boundaries aren't so strictly there. I'm in no position to leave the place where I live. I don't really want to. I'm very happy there. But if I did want to, I couldn't. It would take me a while to get everything in place and to make it happen. But I know it could happen, you know. I know it wouldn't be impossible to move or to just to keep life moving, keep moving on. And uh, I know that I'd also be, you know, very foolish perhaps if I was doing something as practical as that to rely on any sort of spiritual esoteric discipline. Or would I? Maybe not, maybe not, because I've always allowed myself to be guided by what I imagine as a child, I imagine to be being guided by God. I still see it as something very close to God and something to do with God. And that's an important thing as well. Any spiritual practice at all, do give it to the angels. I'm always saying that, but they're the ones who can make it really good. And here we are, home again. Just roll down the track nicely now, back into the green.